We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. Good afternoon and welcome back to our next session of SciFest 2022. We are Oh, pretty much halfway through our week and it has been so exciting with so many amazing um, events and programs. Uh, today we are very excited to talk about one of my favourite subjects which is dinosaurs and we've got Alicia from Australian Age of Dinosaurs. Um, a big thank you also goes out to Inspiring Australia New South Wales that is funding these sessions that we're able to do them for you for free for National Science Week. So such a big range of programs for us to uh, celebrate National Science Week um, at the moment. So I'm going to hand over to you, Alicia, and I want to learn about dinosaurs too. Thank you so much, Karen. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Science Week. Thank you so much for joining us today. So today we're going to be learning a little bit about Australian dinosaurs. What are they? Why are we finding them here? What does a paleontologist do? And how can you tell what a dinosaur fossil looks like compared to just a rock. So to begin with, I want to see if you know what is a dinosaur and what isn't a dinosaur. So I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen now and I want you to type into the chat. Is this a dinosaur? What do you think? So it's got wings, it flies around. Is that one a dinosaur? Someone says no. Anyone else? No, yes, yes. All right, so it is a reptile and it was around at the same time as dinosaurs, but it's not actually a dinosaur. It's what we call a pterosaur, so a winged lizard. And as you can see on the screen there, it lived from about 228 to 66 million years ago. It's a flying reptile. So what about the next one? Am I a dinosaur? What do you guys think? Let's check the chat. What are you guys saying? No, no, we've got a yes. All right, so this one here, it's not a dinosaur either. So it's also, it was also around at the same time as dinosaurs. So this one in particular lived about 80 million years ago. It's also a reptile, but it swam in the ocean. So it's not a dinosaur. Next one, am I a dinosaur? What do we think? Looks like dinosaurs, doesn't it? Len says yes. Aiden says yes. Thank you, guys. You're absolutely correct. So what you're looking at right there, right, right there was found here in Winton. And I've got a little replica here to show you guys. He lived about 95 million years ago, and we call him Banjo. And he definitely was a dinosaur. What about the next one? Am I a dinosaur? What do you think? Yes, 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 you guys are spot on. Your knowledge is excellent. This is a dinosaur. So this is Mudabarasaurus that was discovered not very far from here. It lived about 110 to 103 million years ago. And yes, it was. Do we have another one? What about this one? Did it swim? Did it fly? Did it run around on land? Was this a dinosaur? What do we think? Yes. Well done, guys. You're absolutely right. This is Minmi, and it lived a little bit longer ago than our dinosaurs that we're finding here in Winton, 133 to 120 million years ago. So well done, you guys. You're really good at identifying dinosaurs. So what I want to talk to you about is the different kinds of dinosaurs. We don't just have um, dinosaurs in general, and then we don't talk about what sort of ones they are. We've got lizard hipped dinosaurs and that's talking about how their bodies moved where are they 
across their hips, so the lower part of their body here, we can basically break dinosaurs up into two groups. We've got lizard-hipped dinosaurs and bird-hipped dinosaurs. And all the dinosaurs that you know fall into those categories. Now I'm going to switch my camera here and show you a few examples of these dinosaurs. So these may be familiar to you. You might recognize uh, the one at the top left. Now, do you want to try and type it in the chat box? This one here, what's this guy? This one down here, you may have seen him on my shirt. So that one there is Dimatinosaurus Matilde. So this one here, we call him a sauropod. Above we have Mudabarosaurus. Over here, we've got Stegosaurus. This guy's Banjo, and this is Pachylocephalosaurus. Stegosaurus top left, well done. All right, so the different kinds of dinosaurs, are, they belong to a dinosaur family tree. And from the way that their hips moved, we can push them to one side of that tree or the other side. Everything that descended down the line from the bird-hipped dinosaurs and are still alive today are our birds. And technically, they're actually dinosaurs, which is pretty cool, I think. So we have all sorts of dinosaurs that have been found here in Australia, about 25 different species, and they were found in every state across Australia. And they're from chicken size to the size of about a two-story house, if you can imagine, so up to 20 metres long. Now, what is a paleontologist? Have a think. What does a paleontologist do? Their job is to find evidence of dinosaurs. So they look in the ground, they look in the sediment, and they try and find clues of dinosaurs. So they're looking for trace fossils and actual fossils. When we talk about trace fossils, we're talking about things like footprints. Body fossils are the bones. Absolutely right. Thank you, Vimeka. So paleontologists, they look for dinosaur bones. They're trying to fill in the history that we understand about different dinosaurs. So what I've got here today is a whole heap of different fossils to show you guys. I'm going to switch you back to my other camera. So I'm going to pop a fossil underneath my camera and I want you to have a look at it and have a guess. What kind of fossil am I showing you? And I'll give you a hint. It's not a dinosaur. What do we think that one is? Let's go closer. Is it a bone? Ancient insects is a really great guess. So it's not ancient insects. It's not trace. It is actually fossil of something that was alive. So I'll put you out of your misery. What we've got here is forest floor. Close. It does look a bit like ocean floor. It's not fish. It's forest floor. So what you're looking at is leaves and sticks and twigs. And sometimes in this kind of fossil, we can actually see things like pine cones. Let's pop this one over here. How about this one? What do we think this fossil is? It also is not a dinosaur. Any guesses, guys? Ancient tree, really, really good. This is what we call petrified wood. So you can actually see the texture of the bark on it. And when we turn it, you can see the internal structure of a tree. So all living things can be preserved as fossils, not just animals. So let's pop this one over here. Check this little guy out. What's that? Perfect. He's a little crab. He is hundreds of millions of years old and we find fossils like that in central Queensland. Why would we find fossils like crabs in central Queensland? How odd. This one here you may have seen in the region. It's called an ammonite. Now this creature also lived underwater. It had little tentacles that came out of it. So that's a marine fossil and a marine fossil 
is a fossil that we find from an underwater environment. So why are we finding marine fossils in Central Australia? Any ideas? Well, the answer is Central Queensland and into South Australia was once an inland ocean. There was actually five oceans that came across Australia and then retreated back again. And most of the dinosaurs that we find here in Winton, such as this sauropod, actually lived on the edge of the inland sea. So these little guys that you can see here were preserved after their lives in the inland sea that was quite shallow and lovely and cool. Now, behind me, you can see this lovely picture. We've got black soil, okay? If you've seen this, you'll know that those cracks can sometimes go really, really deep. This is the kind of soil that we have in some parts of outback Queensland. We have black soil here in Winton where we're located. And this black soil is the reason that we're digging up fossils here. So these cracks in the black soil are because when black soil gets wet from huge amounts of rain, it actually swells and it can swell to about 10 times its size swelling up and pushing together. When it dries out, all of that volume is actually lost. And so all of that soil that was swollen and pushed together pulls apart and cracks form between it. So what you get is these cracks here. And the black soil level actually goes down between one and four meters deep. So those cracks can actually become really, really deep. And what we see in central Queensland is that once those cracks fill up with water again and then expand, it acts to turn the black soil and it actually brings those fossils to the surface. And that's why we found this guy. His fossils were pushed up over thousands of years of rainy season, dry season, rainy season, dry season, and this self-mulching, rotating black soil. So we're really, really lucky here in Winton that we've got this soil because we have a dinosaur bone bonanza. So fossilization. Do you guys understand why we find fossils? This is really heavy. So this is our petrified wood. It doesn't feel like a piece of wood anymore. It is very heavy. It's a stone now. However, it's kept the same shape and the same coloration, almost the same coloration as the original piece of wood. So what happens is when you have something living, it may get covered up by sand or mud. They'll end up layering down on top of it. When that happens, minerals can seep down into this organic matter. So organic meaning it was once alive. This might be a bone or it might be a branch. And those minerals actually set hard like rock. So when we dig up fossils, we're not actually usually digging up the original organic material. We're digging up material that is exactly the same shape, but it's now become mineralized and fossilized. So that's what we're finding. But as you can see from this one here, they don't always come back to us in one piece. This one here is from a sauropod. So our sauropod is this guy here. Whoop this side <laughs> our sauropod is this guy here so his bones were meters long you know some of them were 10 centimeters across but some of them were like two meters long this looks like an internal bone piece from a much larger piece of bone and when we found it it's actually been fractured and broken by the black soil turning it and pulling it up little piece at a time so what we can do is actually match these pieces together and stick them together before we start drilling away the bone that's attached to them so that we can understand what shape this dinosaur was. So I brought with me today this here. Does anybody know why I've got a fossil with a rubber band around it? So those of you that have been to a museum that has a working laboratory might have an idea. That might give you a clue there. Yes. Um, so some for Mika has said to keep them intact. It is to keep it together because one of the jobs that we have here at the museum is actually looking at the pieces that we get from a dig site and puzzling them. 
So that's what's happened with this one. I've just pulled the rubber band off it and I want to show you how it locks together. So these were two pieces that we found that our scientists and diggers realized were organic, they were a fossil, and that they might be able to be pieced together. So we ended up with a whole table of fossils, all different shapes and sizes and colors. And we have people looking through that, trying to figure out how to put it together. So this one here is quite angular, which means it hasn't been roughed up or rounded off very much. So it should be a nice sharp connect. What we also have is a seam running through it and a seam running through this bit. And when you put them together, they actually click really well and fit perfectly together. So what we'll do with this piece is rubber band it. A bunch of scientists will come along and check it and make sure it is a perfect match. And then we'll actually use glue to stick that together and we'll go looking for the rest of the pieces so we know what kind of dinosaur this actually came from. So dinosaur fossils are really, really fragile. So how do we know what a fossil looks like? All right, those two pieces probably looked a lot like rock to you. What I'm gonna show you now are some samples that we've put in little cases and they were put together by our scientists because the people that discover fossils here are often farmers. So what I'm showing you in this little dish here is some samples of dinosaur bone and some samples of other living creatures who've died and left their bones on our fields here. And what I'm showing you, in those bones on the left-hand side, the modern one has some nice stripy structure on the outside of the bone. On the right-hand one, so this one over here, we can see a sort of bubbly texture. So that might be a sheep or a cow. And what you're looking at, on the left is the outside of the bone, on the right is the inside of the bone. And then when we look at the bottom of this dish, we're looking at dinosaur bone. It has the same structure. So what we end up with is sheep farmers, um, cattle farmers going through their fields, noticing bones that look just like roo bones or cow bones or sheep bones, but they're much bigger. So it might be the end of, you know, like a limb bone that has the double bump on the end like a chicken bone does, but instead of it being this much across and belonging to a sheep, they're finding ones that are this far across and they belong to sauropods. That's how they understand what it is. So I've got a little fun experiment for you and it's a good excuse to go and buy some chocolate. So what have we got here? Chuck it in the chat box if you know what I've got here. Flakes, perfect Len. So they're flake chocolate, okay? We're playing with chocolate today. Now the reason that I'm showing you flake chocolate is that it is very similar in texture to the outside of a dinosaur bone. So I'm also gonna show you the piece that I puzzled together, this one here. When you look at the outside of the bone, it has a very similar texture to flake, okay? And that's how you know what you found is the outside of a dinosaur bone. What about these ones? What have we got there? Now I'll give you a hint at something that I've chopped up. Maltesers. <laughs> Well done. All right. So Maltesers, they resemble something else dinosaur. Um, what we're looking at when we look at Maltesers and that structure is a kind of a circular texture. It's kind of bubbly, isn't it? Now, what that texture is very similar to is actually the inside of dinosaur bone. So imagine if a dinosaur bone was snapped in half and we were looking at the cross section or the very inside parts of that bone. The structure is bubbly and circular like the inside of Maltesers or an aero bar if you can find one. So this is a really great example of the structure and the texture of the inside of a dinosaur bone. So if you're traveling along in outback Queensland and you find a rock that has this kind of structure, you might think to yourself, maybe it's not a rock, maybe it has some sort of an organic history. So these are some of the ways that we can actually tell what's a dinosaur bone and what's just a rock out there. But basically, let me come back to you. 
When we find a little piece of dinosaur bone, we mark that spot down and we send a whole team out and we excavate that whole site. And when we dig and we find some bones, we don't just keep those bones. We will bring back buckets and buckets and buckets of soil and debris that we may not have found anything in just in case we leave something behind. And we'll bring that back to the museum and we'll actually sieve it and we'll go through it and we'll find every single little tiny piece of the puzzle so we can put it all back together again and understand dinosaurs the best we can. So there's one more thing I want to show you. Has anybody heard about paleontologists and archaeologists licking dinosaur bones? Why would they lick dinosaur bones? No, why would they do that? Just a happy pastime. Mm. No. So I'm going to show you one more chocolate. You can do this experiment as well when you're at home. So what have I got here? It's not a flake. It's not Maltesers. Yeah, so it's a honeycomb based chocolate, right? It's crunchy or violet crumble or something like that. Now, the reason that I'm showing you this one is because it responds to water. So what happens when you put one of these chocolates in your mouth? The honeycomb dissolves, but it also kind of snaps and crackles and pops, right? Disappears because it's quite porous. And when water hits it, it basically dissolves it and soaks in immediately. So that's what's happening here. And you can see some of the air bubbles coming to the surface. Now, they're not the only thing that do that. When we find dinosaur bones that look like this, we have the same effect. And so one of the backup ways, if we have a tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of dinosaur bone, such as this one here, is that our paleontologists and archaeologists can actually put their tongue to it and they'll have a really similar effect as when they put their tongue on a crunchy bar or a chocolate bar. I've never done it. I don't think I really want to, but basically you'd put your tongue on there and you would feel that popping and that tingling as it sort of felt like it was dissolving on your tongue. So there's a great reason to walk around your backyard looking rocks. <laughs> um, so thanks for joining me today. Do you have any questions? Type them into the frequently asked questions section at the bottom of your page and Karen can um, pass on your questions. If you want to learn more about Australian dinosaurs, I can send out links to all of you or a little bit more about the museum and we can send you through some activities as well. Thanks for joining me, guys. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alicia. It is really exciting to learn more about Australian dinosaurs and we've got some questions coming through. Oh, someone's just laughing about licking rocks in your backyard. Um, it's something that we do in geology as well. So um, it is actually one of those things. If you do soil science, you end up playing in mud. You're rolling bits of mud to work out whether what kind of um, uh, clay or sandy soil it is. And in geology, you lick rocks as well. We've got a question through to the chat. Why does a Mudabarosaurus have a um, crest on, in its nose? Right, so they don't actually know exactly why that crest is there yet, but with all of the horned and crested dinosaurs, there's all sorts of theories and papers being written about maybe it's used for um, signaling and communicating with the other animals, maybe it's used as part of the mating process, um, but with paleontology and a lot of scientists, sciences, we're using clues and every day there are papers coming out with more and more understandings of them. Excellent, thank you. Um, um, how can I become a paleontologist? What subjects should I learn? Okay, so to foster a career in paleontology, you basically have to love science. You've got to be able to keep with your passion and get really excited about something. Most of the paleontologists that I've met through the museum out here have a bit of a history in geology. So they will study earth sciences, they may study geology. Some of them study natural history, but the vast majority will go from high school and they'll go on to uni and they'll study some sort of applied science field. And then when they go on to do their masters, they will actually go somewhere where they're studying or digging or um, describing dinosaurs and they'll start writing papers and from there basically all paleontologists find a favorite dinosaur or a favorite era and they'll take it and run with it and write as much as they can on the topic but 
If you are still in primary school, keep experimenting with science. Stay engaged and take up every opportunity to go and see your museums and be involved in science activities. If you're in high school, take your science subjects and go on as many excursions as you can to learn about Australian science. Excellent idea. And you know, even if you are in remote um, areas across Australia, there is small museums everywhere throughout Australia and they will absolutely have um, different fossils and rocks from your local area. Uh, we've got another question here. What is the smallest dinosaur you've found so far? Right, so I was at our working laboratory the other day and I was really, really lucky to be beside one of our preppers who usually drills away on our dinosaur bones and she was going through sieving material. So similar to this sort of thing from leftover from a dig and she was using tweezers to actually sort through one grain of sand and dirt at a time. And over the course of a few days, managed to find crocodile teeth from the Cretaceous period. So on the scale of hundred million years old, and they were about a millimeter across. Wow. So absolutely tiny. So you've always got to make sure re that you're very, very careful. And yeah, as you said, going through the, the leftover pieces that, um, you know, it might not always be the big things. It's the small things that help tell us that fossil story. Um, it was very exciting. <laughs> Aidan's interested to know how you dug up Australovenator. Right. So we call him Banjo here. He's got a little nickname after Banjo Patterson. But basically he was found alongside Matilda, so one of our sauropods that we find heaps of in this area, they were actually buried together. So we found the sauropod bones and kept digging. We're always digging around our sauropod remains, trying to find traces of other dinosaurs that might have been around in the area. And we do often find theropod teeth. So theropod, that's the kind of dinosaur that Banjo was. He was a predator and a carnivore. This little guy here. He was much smaller than Matilda, our sauropod. We don't really know for sure how the two of them ended up dying and buried together. But one theory is that Matilda, a sauropod, got her legs bogged in the mud. And this little guy came along and thought she was a tasty treat and tried to attack her. And maybe she tail whopped him and he's died. She's remained stuck. They have both died in the mud together and we were lucky enough to actually find them together and the remains were quite complete. So they're really important specimens. Wow, that's a great story. Um, if you live in a city, where can you find fossils? Right, so depending on what city you live in, you can go to your state or your capital city museum. So most of your natural history museums will have fossils and they won't just have dinosaur fossils. They'll have things like these ammonites um, and they'll be able to tell you where they were found, what the majority of those fossils um, are doing in that area, because we find a lot of marine fossils to the north of here. And it's to do with how the continental plate is actually tilted in this area and where that inland sea was. So all of your local natural history museums, sometimes even your schools in the area will have a collection. You just need to ask. <laughs> Fabulous. And, you know, over time as well, I travel around. I was actually really lucky to go up and um, visit Winton um, in the last school holidays. And, you know, when you go to museums, you can actually buy fossils as well. I actually bought a piece of fossilised wood um, when I was up there at the museum. Um, so, you know, when you do go out and about, you can buy fossils to help start building your own collection as well. Um, what's a, couple, a couple of people are asking, what's the biggest dinosaur you've found? And someone was saying, is it Matilda? Matilda is probably not the biggest sauropod out there. Matilda would have been about 20 metres long. Um, Matilda is part of a branch of dinosaurs called sauropods and they're the ones that you see with the really long neck and the small head, the long tail and those thick legs to support them. Some of those that have been found across the world are up to 40 metres long. So you may need to actually map that out to really sort of get your head around how big that is, but basically probably wider than the front of most of your house blocks is how big this one was. Oh, wow. Uh, another question was, uh, was the Matabatosaurus a, a quadruped or could it also run on two legs? It did run on two legs, we believe. Um, Matabatosaurus is really interesting in that 
Lots of little pieces of those fossils were found in the region and people thought they were special and took them and kept them in their homes. And it wasn't until a couple of people that noted how important this one was um, decades later that everybody started putting together their fossil pieces and realized it was part of the same specimen. And they had this huge leap forward in science where they're actually able to assemble the skeleton of the Matabarasaurus and put it on display so that we could understand this really special species of dinosaur in the area. So um, science isn't just about discovery and learning, it's also about sharing and collaborating with people. And that leads us perfectly into our last question at the moment, which is, do you share to different museums and send things on tour? Absolutely. Yep. So you may have heard um, that zoos do it to increase biodiversity. They share animals for breeding projects and things like that. Museums do it as well. So it's not just natural history museums, it's art museums as well. There's no point in one collection sitting in the one place for too long. Basically, it'll become stagnant and everybody in the area will have already seen it. Or people coming to your muse museum might only get this tiny little view of one particular era or area of dinosaur fossils. So what we do is we share samples. We've got heaps of sauropod fossils here. So we can actually afford to send them out and get collections from other places throughout the world so that we can have them here on display. And we can say to our guests, these are the dinosaurs that lived around 100 million years ago, but come and look over here in a different area in the world, 140 million years ago, we had these guys getting around. So absolutely, we try and share and collaborate with our collections as well. Excellent. And a couple final questions. What do you think the tiny crocodile uh, teeth came from? Do you do you know or would you think it was a juvenile? So it definitely would have been a juvenile um, to be as small, for those teeth to be as small as they were, it would have been a baby crocodile. But we had lots of crocodiles in the same area that our sauropods were getting around when that inland sea was quite shallow. We had crocodiles and we had turtles and all sorts of things. So we do tend to find lots of crocodile teeth in the area. Um, we're always excited when we come across them though. That's excellent. And last um, question, can you buy fossils online? Um, I know that you um, have an online shop with Australian Age of Dinosaurs as well. Maybe we can share the link. Absolutely. We'll share the link afterwards. So we've got all sorts of things in our shop, lots of t-shirts and science activities and things like that. But we do also sell some dinosaur fossils through our shop. Um, from, as Karen was saying, petrified wood through to ammonites, through to actual dinosaur fossils. Excellent. Guys, thank you so much for those fabulous questions and thank you for joining us today for SciFest 2022. Alicia, I've learned so much today as well <laughs> about different dinosaurs and um, about fossils. So big round of applause, everyone. Thank you to Alicia. Thank you for getting involved in National Science Week. Uh, remember, there is some great programs still coming up for day four and five. Um, we'll share the link when we send out the recording later on um, this evening. So thanks for joining us again, and I look forward to seeing you for more SciFest 2022. See you Thank later. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Bye.